So, Night School. Night School. Prodigal God by Timothy Keller. Mm -hmm. This is a book by a pretty smart dude breaking down a parable that Jesus presented to a crowd of Pharisees, as in religious people, and the sinners that everybody knows, Doug Jesus. Yeah. And uh, this book r repeatedly refers back to a little brother and older brother dichotomy because yeah. in the parable that Jesus talks about, there's a younger brother and an older brother. And the younger brother is like the passionate wild card. And the older brother is like the more stiff, self-righteous one. Okay. And so they have, they both have different equal sinful conditions. There's really mm -hmm. not a good guy or bad guy in the story. But in the book, he's talking about how you really see this pattern unfold with younger and older siblings and how that's funny. And I was thinking about it and there's, it's not all commonalities between us, but some of them is like the, the little brother is sinful in the way that he's going to go out and get a bunch of hookers. But mm -hmm. the older brother is sinful in the way that he's like judgmental. And it's like, interesting. I am more likely to go out and get a bunch of hookers than you are probably. Yeah. And so it's and pretty funny. I've, I've noticed that like in the last couple of weeks, there's been a couple times where you've like said something about me being self-righteous, which isn't something yeah. you've said before. So that was right. something you were getting like from this book kind of. Right. And we had what we had some deep talk a couple of weeks ago, right? Where I was like, man, I got this like anger lingering. Let's talk it out. Yeah. And it, and then the self-righteous thing came out in that conversation. Yeah. And, uh, and it was pro it probably came out in that conversation partially because I read it in this book. Sure. But then also maybe it could, because I was talking to Courtney and we roasted you a little bit. So mm -hmm. maybe it came out because of that too. Sure. <laughs> but anyway, I really like this guy and I think it's really cool that, uh, that two brothers get to discuss a Jesus parable about two brothers. That is cool. Yeah. So, uh, my, like knee jerk reaction when I heard the title, the prodigal God is it caught me off guard because I know the prodigal son story is about it's the younger son is the prodigal son. He goes out and blows his whole inheritance and then comes back and has to grovel mm -hmm. to his father. I'll tell the story in a sec. And so when I heard the prodigal God, I was like, are we saying that like God had to like come back and grovel to people? Like, what does that even mean? The prodigal God? What, what does prodigal mean? It turns out it means uh, having spent all, having spent everything. Hmm. And so the son was a prodigal son because he went out, spent everything, and then he came back. And then uh, okay. they, they're calling God the prodigal God because he will spend everything to, to gather back the hearts of the people that are all lost from God in their own ways, that have all lost the way for different reasons, okay. lost the way in their own individual ways. Gotcha. And he'll spend everything that he has to, or spend everything yeah. to, to win everybody back. So... I'll start by uh, reading the parable. I think it's right at the beginning of the book. Yeah, cool. That's good context. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him. And this is in uh, Luke, by the way, which is one of the four books in the Bible that are the story of the stuff Jesus did. Luke was a doctor, so he was a pretty <clears throat> objective reporter of the things that he saw. Mm -hmm. Good historian. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Jesus continued. So it skips ahead because Jesus tells two other parables that are also about finding a lost valuable thing. Mm -hmm. They're just simple little parables though. It's like, like if you lose a sheep and then you find it, you celebrate the sheep that was lost and that you found, not the sheep you already still had. And when you lose a pearl, you go find the one pearl that you lost. And then, so the two simple parables, and then he goes into this deep dive one that low-key roasts the Pharisees in the audience. Mm -hmm. There was a man who had two sons. Younger son said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Mm -hmm. So he said he wanted his father's inheritance. Or he wanted his inheritance from his father while his father was still alive. That's shitty. Right. All right. And, uh, and also, being the younger brother... At, cultural context the older brother would have normally gotten more inheritance than the younger brother sure but it sucks that we changed that i know it's so lame <laughs> <laughs> so but it sounds like he split it equally so mm -hmm. he did more than he had to do even if it was acceptable to give an inheritance while you were not dead yet got it so son is a little douchebag not long not long after that the younger son got together all he had, set off to a far country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living, um, which included hookers. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, 
and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. The pods that the pigs were eating, I think it was like corn cobs or like just the cobs, not even the corn or some trash like that. Mm. And he couldn't even eat that. So he comes to his senses, hits rock bottom. He says, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And I'm here starving to death. I'll set out and go back to my father and say to him, father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he's like, I'll just go back and be one of my dad's employees. That's better than this shit. But still not better than where he started. Yeah. So he's desperate as fuck. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him, ran to his son, threw his arms around him, kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Father says to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. This son of mine was dead and is now alive again. He was lost and is found. So they start partying. Meanwhile, the older son is in the field. He comes near the house. He hears music and dancing. So he calls one of the servants and asks him what's going on. Your brother has come, the servant tells him, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. So the elder brother gets pissed, yeah. refuses to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him, but he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, You're always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive. Again, he was lost and is found. And that's one of the commonalities with us is you've always been more justice-oriented. And I've always been sure. more lax. Like, I would be a lot more likely to cheat in a board game than you would. Yeah, And you'd probably. be like, oh, we're not finishing this fucking board game until we set this straight. How, does, how does any of this work if we can't even follow? <laughs> yeah, so, it, <laughs> so the older brother is like, this is not just, this is not fair. And he's right. Um... But, so side note, I thought of you also when I heard uh, the part where the son comes back and the father just, without even responding to his apology, just embraces him, because that was your favorite moment from Avatar. Yeah, yeah. Where, what's his face, Suko comes back yeah. to Iroh, the and uncle like, he betrayed, and just grabs him and hugs him. Yeah, he starts trying to apologize, and Iroh doesn't even let him finish. Yeah. And he's like, thinks he's going to have to, like, beg for forgiveness, and it's, exactly. it's not like that at all. But because Iroh is Jesus AF, and yeah. he saw that... Zuko was appearing with genuine humility. That's all That's all he could ever ask for. Just, yeah. oh, this little dick bag has shown up genuinely sorry and humble. This is all I want. That's it. It's yeah. totally like that. Um, so it's, it's apparent that if Jesus told that story to a crowd of, of wild sinners that were attracted to his message and a crowd of religious people, the younger brother represented the wild sinners, the older brother represented the religious people, and so the typical interpretation of the story, the one that I've mostly heard, is that it's about the son who got lost and came back. And Timothy Keller breaks it down more like, he, he calls it the prodigal of the two lost sons, the, the younger lost son and the older lost son, because Jesus is really saying to that crowd, it sounds like, you guys are lost for this reason, because you're greedy, you're up your own ass, you will run away and do whatever the hell you want to bring yourself pleasure. Mm -hmm. And then to these people, he's saying, you guys are messed up in this reason. You're so prideful and focused on getting what you think you deserve for your good deeds and making sure that other people who you deem don't deserve it don't get it. You're dicks for this yeah. reason. Yeah. So he's, he's painting a picture of two different sin conditions or two different sin diagnoses. It's yeah. like, here's your issue, here's your issue. But... He's saying that it's easier for the younger brother to get redemption than the older brother. Like he's saying, you mess up more, but you're easier to work with once your heart gets into a place that you're genuinely repentant. Like that Zuko Iroh moment. There's no no counseling needed after that. You know, yeah, they were good. Yeah, because he came with such a heart of brokenness and repentance that it was like. All right, now in this moment when you're at your most vulnerable, I'm going to meet you with complete grace and restore our relationship completely. Now he has to go back to the older son. And this poor dad just got his younger son back, and now his older son's pissed. Mm -hmm. And you, you kind of saw that butthurtness with the Pharisees when they come up and they see Jesus talking to these sinners, and they're like, man, he eats with people that aren't as good as us. We're it's not good guys. Fair. 
Yeah. yeah. And it's not that they're worried about cosmic justice and whether those people being in the presence of, genus, of Jesus is fair. It's that they're worried about the fact that they have his attention instead of them. Like, they're mm-hmm. like, well, what about me? And yeah. so, so killed it with the parable. Uh, a couple interesting notes about uh, cultural context in the story is that there's also some really bold, like, patriarchy challenging in the story that that's hard to catch without the cultural context that Timothy Kelly provided. I'm sure other people too, but um, the fact that he divided the property equally between the younger son and the older son Mm -hmm. could have been a violation of the normal patriarchal order of things that's, no, the the firstborn son gets this amount, the younger son gets this amount. Right. He said, screw that, I'm going to do it this way, I'm going to split it 50-50. And then the fact that he showed emotion and ran out to the younger son as he came in would have been unusual for a patriarchal figure at that time too. It would have been more proper to like post up on the porch, you know, and wait for him to approach and like yeah. make your case. Be you more know? stoic. Exactly. Yeah. He threw all stoicism and pride and patriarchy and all that shit out the window yeah. and ran straight to that fool. And, and then the other one is that he had the humility as the patriarchal head to go plead with the older brother after the fact and say, please come to the party, it'll be fun, Mm -hmm. your brother's here, da-da-da. So instead of maintaining his own pride and just saying, like, no judgment, no judgment, he's like like this bleeding heart patriarchal figure that's running out and kissing his son and giving him a robe and all this stuff. And and he probably had to pick up his robe to run. (laughs) You see his, his little legs running with his robe. And so he's breaking the rules. And that's interesting that Jesus painted a picture that way because I think you could see that with the the shifts that happen in culture from the Judea Judeo to the Christian part in the Judeo Christian tradition. Mm-hmm. There was Jesus was like he challenged cultural norms by talking to women. That was strange that Jesus would just go talk to a woman one on one and provide pastoral care to her. That was progressive and wild at the time. That was like it was like a radical feminist for doing that. Yeah. So. That stuff's really interesting too, because he's also, he's also potentially offending the Pharisees by describing the God representative figure in the parable as breaking those patriarchal codes. That might have been offensive to them too, because he's okay. saying this is what a good father is like. He shows emotion and breaks his pride and treats his son more equally than than culture t- culture tells him to. So there's a lot of sneaky. Uh, teaching in that part of it too, yep. in that aspect of the parable. So, let's see. Another thing interesting that uh, that Timothy Kelly points out is that it's possible that neither the younger or the older son, and this is the younger son up until the point that he came groveling back with a heart of humility, it's, it's possible that neither of them really cared about their father in a completely genuine way because the son, up until the point that he left, was just like, yeah, I just want your money, you know? And then he comes back, and the father shows generosity to him, and then the older brother is like, this isn't fair. I get, I get your things, you know? So mm-hmm. it's like, oh, did either of you like give a shit about your dad? Or like... Right, right. Yeah, I mean, that's like... Uh, that reminds me of like that thing that happened... Like you hear about people starting to fight over, like, their grandpa's oh, stuff God. before they're gone. So ugly. Yeah, yeah, it's so ugly. But then he kind of he kind of opened himself up to that by giving out the inheritance while he was still alive. <laughs> I think, I, I wonder if his point by giving out his inheritance was like, you know what, that's a really poor decision to take my inheritance while I'm still alive. That hurts you more than it hurts me because I still love my son and you don't get to experience love for your father. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to give you what you're asking for in this. I'm going to give you enough rope to go hang yourself with so you can go learn your lesson. And that probably took a lot of faith to do on his part. And it reminds me of the... Yeah. uh, Peterson was talking about how the the moment where who was homie who was going to sacrifice his son on the hill... And then God was like, just kidding, you don't have to kill your son, Abraham. That's right, right. Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. Abraham, uh, God's like, kill Isaac, and Abraham's like, bet. So he takes his kid up the top of the hill, and he's like, I'm going to kill Isaac. And then yeah. God's like, oh, I'm just joking, don't. It's uh, a prank, bro, it's a prank. Yeah, dude, dude, it's a prank, it's a prank. 
So <laughs> God says in that moment, I alone will provide. And so it was a foreshadowing of Jesus to come later, which is part of what can bring some type of rationality to that story is that he was foreshadowing with one of his most famous prophets, hey, sacrifice your son for me. And then the prophet's like, okay. And then mm -hmm. God's like, I'm just playing. I would never make you do that, but I would do that. And so that's part of what's meaningful in the story. But then Peterson talked about the fact that a parent with faith, not and not necessarily what they would call religious faith, but a parent with faith has to sacrifice their child at some point. When it gets to the point where they have to let their kid make their own mistakes, mm. they do have to hand their child over to the na world, nature, the yeah. world, Just God. Hope and hope that it goes okay. Right. Believe that it goes okay. And it, I mean, but it's not even like, you can't even believe that it's going to go okay. You have to believe that it's going to be okay whether it goes okay or not. You know, right? Because if you don't have enough faith to do that, then you're gonna coddle and baby your kids for so long that they never go out to figure out if they could survive or not. Yeah. And so, I think any parent, whether they happen to be a religious person or not, has great faith if they are willing to draw those lines with their kids because they're not playing God in their kid's life anymore. They're saying, "Go out and learn your own lessons." Yeah. So I see that same principle in this story where son asked for the inheritance of his living father and his father's like probably thinking because he's a wise man he's probably thinking this is going to hurt you a lot more than it's going to hurt me like right. i can get over the ego of being betrayed by my son i still love you but this is a bad idea on your part and i'm just going to let you do it i'm just going to give you your money knowing damn well you know I, if dad gave me half of what he owned yeah when i was whatever any age any age but now whatever now <laughs> yeah the stupid shit i would do with it you know and he would yeah. know damn well i'm gonna do some stupid shit with it yeah and so it's like anyway that's uh i see that foreshadowed here not that the father trusted that his son was going to be okay but that the father trusted god or the way of things enough to be okay with the fact that his son might may or may not be okay yeah it's, it's hard to say what what okay means in this sort of context but right i think i might imagine it as like that that putting him on that path will still lead to a net positive life or something like that, or that it'll lead to some sort of positivity in his right. life if he hits that bottom so that he can be built back up or however it's yeah. going to go. It's going to be bad. He is going to get himself into some trouble, but hopefully that trouble will bring him to a better understanding of of God, maybe, yeah. or something like that. And it happened to work in this case. It yeah. did happen to work. I'm sure there's plenty of stories out there where this did not go this well, and the son just went out there and died. Yeah. Um, he just went out and got syphilis or whatever the hell people got back then. And mm -hmm. uh, and maybe he did, too, but, but it happened to play out okay this time that the son did go out and make his own mistakes and come back with the right heart and become reunited with his father. And now... Father has to deal with a completely different issue, which is the fact that now the other son is jealous. So, you, I'm sure, I'm sure you heard Pharisees say shit like that all the time, and you even do in this one little story. Why is he hanging out with them instead of me? Why is yep. he? It's like, well, if you have a problem with the fact that God is showing grace to people that you don't think He should show, then you don't love. You, you're. I shouldn't say you don't, but. You're not speaking out of love for God or those people. So what? So from what spirit are you speaking? If you have a problem with the fact that God has shown grace to someone, you don't think he deserves it. You think that you're a better judge than God? Or, or the fact that Jesus would show grace to those people makes you question his authority because you're not willing to bow down to a God that would show grace to somebody you don't like? So like, was this about faith in God or was it about faith in God as long as God does what you want him to do? You know, it's like, what are the intentions of these people? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think jealousy must be a big part of it. Just mm -hmm. like uh, feeling that they're not getting what they deserve, despite the fact that they work so much harder. And that, right. it makes sense that that mm -hmm. would be upsetting. Right. I get that. Doesn't make any sense to me at all. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> So Timothy Kelly, uh, he, he called the younger brother the rebel and the older brother the pleaser uh, at one point and said that the rebel and the pleaser both want the father's riches more than they want the father just for different reasons. 
The rebel wants the father's riches more than he wants the father because he doesn't want to follow the rules. And the pleaser wants the father's riches more than he wants the father because he knows that he can use the rules to his own advantage. And so it's like whether you're such a relativist or such a moralist that you hate rules or love rules so much, either way it can separate you from God on either side of that dichotomy. Like, totally. Oh, fuck rules. I don't follow any rules. Like, uh, life, life doesn't work that way. That's not going to work. Like, yeah. I love rules. I follow every rule I've ever heard, and I deserve to be rewarded greatly for it, and other people yeah. don't because they didn't. It's like, you're both, you're both lost. Yeah, yeah. This is kind of like we were talking about recently about just like kind of the political spectrum and how like it can tip too far either way. Right. And the sort of older son seems to represent more like the conservative side of things. Like, I yeah. guess if you had to assign yeah. it that way, but that's, yeah, that's how things work. Any kind yeah. of spectrum can tip too far right. either way. Yeah. yeah. And he, uh, Timothy Kelly uses the word conservative and the word liberal one time each in the book. He touches on it one time. And the comparison he makes is, calling the conservative the moralist and calling the liberal the relativist, calling the conservative the religious and calling the liberal the irreligious. So he's, he's not a political analyst. He, he didn't go deep on that. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm reading Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion by Jonathan Haidt. And uh, I might dive into that side of things a little bit when I present that one, mm -hmm. kind of tie back into this one a little bit, because Jonathan Haidt does a deep dive on the yin and yang of conservatism and liberalism. Uh, one of the things that I personally learned from this book was uh, Timothy Kelly called out people who are Pharisees toward Pharisees. It's like, oh yeah, that's me. For, sh for definite certain, that's like me. Like people that are aware of the fact, uh, like aware of the folly of the older brother. Yeah. And so they're like, oh, and they're just older brothering at the, old, yeah. Yeah, and okay. I totally, uh, I'll go into a church community and I'll meet some people who like, who I deem are real Christians, you know, and then people who I deem are Pharisees. It's, it's easy for me to have grace for just a tweaker on the street that we're just bullshitting about God at night I, I can see God in that person easily. Mm. But when I see a religious person yep. who is like, who is so concerned with what they consider godly cleanliness that they don't even want anything to do with poor people and it's like mm -hmm. turned into something else, I have trouble looking at that and being like, well, you're a great person. You follow the rules and da-da-da, but you just haven't figured out how to have the right heart. To, I, I, don't, I don't have grace for it. I don't. Yeah, like, I just I see it and I'm like, fake-ass Christian. I yeah. just write them off. It's right. Like, but it doesn't matter how many like levels of self-awareness deep you are right. into being a Pharisee. You're still doing the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, and, and it's uh, something I've noticed about the concept of a Pharisee is it's just like the concept of a slut, right? Everybody thinks that you're a slut if you're sluttier than, yeah. like, if you're sluttier than me, you're a slut. And if you're me not as slutty as me, anybody else in the room at the time. <laughs> right. Yeah. So if everybody here, if we're talking about sluts, it's anybody who's sluttier than us three. You know, like what well, we're doing is fine, but like, you know, people that get like crazy with it. Yeah. I have, I have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's the same thing happens with the Pharisee where people will judge anybody who's a little more Pharisaic or however you'd say that a little more hypocritical or religious or whatever than them. It's like, I remember uh, when I first started going to New Vintage a couple years ago or whenever that was, I asked somebody what a Pharisee meant because I was trying to learn all this goddamn Christianese. Mm -hmm. And somebody told me what a Pharisee meant. And then I was like, okay, it didn't, didn't sound quite right. When I learned what a Pharisee was from another source that went a little deeper later, I was like, oh, now I know what a Pharisee is. But the person who told me just described the first example they could think of of someone being more of a Pharisee than them. But this person was more of a Pharisee than me. So then I looked at my own definition of Pharisee and decided that a Pharisee was anyone who was more of a Pharisee than me. And yeah. it's just it's so ridiculous. Yeah. And ho like hopefully I can fully digest this parable or fully embody this parable to the point that I can see how the Father had grace for both of those characters, even in the extremes they were represented in, and that I could have the same grace for both of those brothers, even in those extremes. Yeah. I'm not there yet, though. I'm still a Pharisee of Pharisees. So the book gave me some homework. But you're a level deeper, at least. Well, I'm one level Slightly deeper. Slightly more self-aware. So anybody who doesn't know that they're a Pharisee to Pharisees is a Pharisee compared to me now. Yeah. Because I'm aware that I'm a Pharisee, so I'm fine. Dirt bags. <laughs>
Timothy Keller quoted Amazing Grace, and I was like, damn, I, I've never, you know, I've never sat down and psychoanalyzed Amazing Grace, but when I read this passage in this context, like, this guy was really talking about some shit. said, Our pleasure and our duty, though opposite before, since we have seen his beauty, are joined to part no more. So, our pleasure and our duty, though opposite before, since we have seen his beauty, are joined to part no more. So, like, our pleasure and our responsibility used to be two different things. You can have pleasure or you can be responsible. Mm -hmm. Now that we've seen the beauty of God, they're joined and they will never part again. Our responsibility and oh. our pleasure. Okay. So, if, if we can get to a point where we fully embody and digest this parable, and we understand that both of those people have access to God and are both fucked up in their own reasons, and hopefully, as a side note, also see ourselves in both sides of the story, mm -hmm. then we'll get to a point where we have been transformed by the grace that, that God has for us, no matter how messed up we are, and that makes us actually enjoy being moral because we understand that we're being moral in service of, of of someone or something god that's just as in service to us like did just as much did more for us that we would they would when we think about behaving morally we would think we'd be excited to behave morally because we have found that that god that center morality has a grace that attracts us to him mm -hmm. like i uh, i took caitlin to the library one time and uh I was thinking of, I was thinking about grace that day and I took her to the library I got her a book and I told her uh, you have to give this book back to me by blah 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 or I'm gonna get fined I'm just gonna have to pay him for the book and uh, and I was like and if you lose it then you don't owe me anything and I'll pay the fine for you and forgive you mm -hmm. and uh, and I, side note she never did give me the book and uh, I never did pay the fine but that's beside the point. You know, uh, one time I had a collection agency come after me for like for a twenty dollar book fee to Richland Library. <laughs> They'll do that. How much <laughs> money do these people have that they have the time to come after us like that? Like I, somebody there must have been an app, like a man hour of work somewhere, <laughs> from paperwork right. or what? I don't. For twenty bucks, <laughs> they did that though. Wow. <laughs> so, hopefully, I had to sh I had to share the fact that she never gave the book back to me and I never paid the fine to the library to point out the fact that I'm not a good person. But if, but that sort of grace where it's like, Hey, if you make a mistake, when, when we get there, I'm going to love you anyway mm -hmm. and embrace you. And I'm even going to cover it for you. Like, that's what God is saying. Prodigal is going to spend everything. Like he's saying, I'll die and give up everything just to cover up your mistakes that I let you make. Like the father's saying, it's like, I gave you the opportunity to do whatever you want with this money. Yeah. You did the worst thing you could possibly do with it. You came back. Now I'm covering for you and looking after you to help you from the sin that you committed against me. And it's like, if you can understand that, if you believe that that is God's character, that God is so selfless that he lets us make mistakes mm -hmm. and gives us a second chance if we come back repentant and humble after that mistake, then you could get to a place where you understand godly morality and you enjoy living out godly morality. And it's not like, like porn, for example, it's like, I want to go watch porn and it'd be fun if I did. Mm -hmm. And it'd be boring to be responsible and not watch porn instead be in a place where it's like, no, the, the better connection that I have with God for not doing something animalistic and just pleasure seeking like that is mm -hmm. more enjoyable and beautiful than whatever sin I wanted to commit anyway. So you get the pleasure and responsibility as one thing. And yeah. that seems like a like that seems like a yin and yang coming together in perfect union for, for enlightenment type of thing to me. Like if Yeah. Because yeah. those those monks that that behave super morally and they just look like they're having a blast all the time. You look in their eyes and it's like they know something. Yeah. They know a secret and they're just delighted. It's like yeah. how are you having so much fun sitting around doing nothing? You know, like how yeah. are you like, maybe they are in that place where they understand the way, is that the way is actually the most enjoyable. Yeah, they've seen some sort of truth that is something like taking complete responsibility is a lot more fun than any fun you could ever try right. and have, which C is C. hard Lewis. to believe even for me right now as I say that. Yeah, me too. Uh, if I believed it, I would live it out, you know, <laughs> right. and I don't, so I obviously don't. Right. 
I can see it as a goal. Like if I could get myself psychologically oriented around that idea mm -hmm. that the most ethical thing that you can do makes you feel the best, yeah. then life would be a lot better. But I don't, I don't buy that yet. And that seems plausible. I need plausible. to make some more mistakes first yeah. before I buy that. It seems plausible, but boring. Right. It's like, <laughs> nerd. Yeah. C.S. Lewis had a quote. Um, I don't remember the whole thing, but it's something like, uh, like we just we just squander about with, with junk food and nonsense and and like, roll like pigs in little pleasures, not knowing that there is a, an eternity of joy waiting for us if we could choose to live differently. And then yeah. at that, that the all, that's all butchered. He didn't say a word of that probably, but that was the general idea. And then at the end he said, we are far too easily pleased. And so he flips, he flips morality on its head and says that you should have a higher standard for what you consider pleasure if you want to live morally. You should say, um. no, I don't want like blowing all my money to go to the bar and <laughs> socialize for a couple hours and spend $65 on drinks. I don't want that kind of pleasure. I want saving up my money and buying the bicycle I've wanted since I was a kid kind of pleasure. I yeah. want something higher. I want something better. And then I want giving my money to the poor and not telling anybody about it just to celebrate the purity of heart God has given me kind of pleasure. And then, no, I want, you know, like we should have higher yeah. standards for that stuff is more pleasing. Yeah. It is. It's just a, it's a longer game. You know? Yeah. It's long, long game pleasure seeking can be godly. Like, just like Jesus says, like, don't stack up treasures where moths are going to come eat it. Stack up treasures in heaven. So, like, if all your cars are going to go yeah. away when you die and you're just left with your tortured soul for all the shit you haven't dealt with, and you just got to deal with that on the other side rather than not valuing your physical possessions and realizing they're finite. But, but, when you're 92 years old and you're getting Alzheimer's and the reality is slipping away, you're at peace. You know, stack up your stack up your treasures over there. It's going to be a lot better for you. Yeah, yeah. Get things that you can bring with you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You can bring your connection with God with you. You can bring your character with you. If John Chang's right, you can bring your chi with you. Right. Yeah. Yeah, whatever chi is. You I can still bring don't it. understand. You get to... You know what's funny though is since we've been reading those books, I've yeah. been feeling like a, uh, like a spasming and twitching around where you said the uh, Dantian. The Dantian is, yeah. Interesting. It's probably happened to me about five times a day for the past like three or four days. Hmm. It's just like this, just like fluttering and twitching. That's like feels like around like where my bladder would be or something. Yeah. You said three fingers under the belly button. I think they said four, four fingers below the. Belly. I was gonna say it's four, not three, because mm. you said three. And I was like, I, I felt, I was like, no, it's definitely a solid four fingers, but that's close enough. But yeah, it, it was four fingers huh. below my belly button. But maybe you should see a doctor. No. Nah. <laughs> Probably just your dantian. No, dude, I'm going to pray about it. Not appendicitis, it. dantian. I'm gonna, where's your appendix? You don't know. Uh, about four fingers below your navel. <laughs> There's no way. It's, There's no way. It's somewhere, on, it's on one of the sides. It's not in the middle. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, this is dead center, four fingers below my belly button. And it says... That's really interesting. And then it happened today, and I sat and, like, prayed for a second. Or not prayed, but, like, tried to bring my consciousness into my body and bring my awareness into my body and just, like, flutter again. Like, let me feel what that was. And, like, I couldn't get it to happen again. Hmm. But it's been uh, just spasming. It's weird. Timothy Kelly also... Dude, I've been saying it wrong this whole time. Timothy Keller. Not the whole time. You've been going back and forth. Nuh-uh. A little bit. No, that's not true. Oh, okay. No. I mean, can I'm you wrong. edit all those out where I said uh, Keller or Kelly? <laughs> <laughs> so, Keller is the right one. You don't really have to edit it. <laughs> <laughs> just edit your voice over, just saying yeah, Keller. When I Keller. <laughs> Keller. Keller. <laughs> Microsoft Sam. Keller. 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 <laughs> the... The idea of the fall, that there was a perfect state of humanity and choice brought us out of that perfect state and God's grace is now bringing us back into that perfect state and we're in the process of that story unfolding. Timothy Keller points out that the fall also means that everybody is the prodigal son too. So even though 
he is okay. addressing the sinners and the tax collectors and the audience as the prodigal son um, and addressing the Pharisees as the older son with the other issue. They are all prodigal sons too. Yeah. So I think if Within one of the those... context of this small picture of this of this story and right. of the lives of the people that Jesus are talking to, yeah, they're each on one side. But yeah. if you look big enough, we're all prodigal son. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And so in that sense, the story is, a, it might be a little more about the prodigal son because I don't know that everybody in the audience would have fit from the big picture perspective, the older son role. So maybe it is more about the prodigal son, you know, because all of them in a way are the prodigal son and half of the characters in the story under the father are the prodigal son. But, yeah. but anyway, he, I think if a Pharisee who was sitting there listening to Jesus tell that story fully digested the story, they'd be like, okay, so not only am I worse off than these people that I'm judging because my spiritual condition is harder to treat because my pride is stopping it from connecting with me. I'm also the prodigal son too. I'm also the the crooked being that that strayed from God to do whatever I wanted anyway in the in the Adam way. Like in the in the deep down in my roots way, if you believe that Judeo Christian idea that there was a perfect state, we chose to leave it. That's our ancestor. That's us too. You know, like it's the the fall is not just Adam chose to fall and Eve chose to fall and it's their fault. Mm -hmm. The fall is like all of us deep down chose this. This is all of our fault. And so right. the the Pharisees could have had that realization too. Like, God, I'm the dick older brother and the dick younger brother at the same time. I'm worse off than them. And if they did, they would have the heart of humility that got little homie invited back into the house. And they would have a great epiphany about God in that moment. Yeah. If they realize, like, I'm just as guilty as homeboy and I'm guilty in a different way, they would realize in that moment, God, how could you have grace for me? I'm using your name in vain by claiming to be a representative of God, but turning away people that you love just as much as you love me. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I've turned away from you just like they did. Right. Because of that fall idea. And, and then God would meet them the same way. You know, throw the best robe on him. He's coming home. Yeah. Yeah, they're judging themselves at some level mm -hmm. that they can't remember because we mm -hmm. don't really remember making that decision. Right? To yeah, fall. we don't. Yeah. yeah, there's. I mean, I uh, I chat with a guy named Eugene sometimes. I've told you a lot about him. Yeah, he's a homeless guy that uh, is nomadic. Uh, I met him at the park in Richland a couple times. I just went out to Benton City to hang out with him a couple weekends ago, and uh, the he's he's not a Christian. He was uh, treated horrifically by a by a pseudo Christian religious cult when he was a child, and uh, so he's really not down with the whole "I'm on the Christian team" thing. Mm -hmm. But the crux of his faith is this vision that he had, where he was flying around in a spirit world where you weren't physical bodies; you're just these floating things. You weren't there wasn't separation between you and other beings. And there was this one rock that they weren't supposed to go to. And they were told they'd be away from the presence of God if they went to that rock. Mm -hmm. And they were like, his reasoning was, that doesn't even make sense. Like, away from the presence of God. That's not even, you know, that, that doesn't even make any sense. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to go there. Fuck it. So he goes there and leads other spirits with him. And then some of those spirits that were following him there were like, he, they were in a portal going to this place. And the spirits were getting sucked out. Like, there was higher spirits sucking them out and not letting them make that mistake because they were being misled. Oh. And then some of them that they let make the decision. And then he woke up on earth feeling like he had led 50,000 people there. And he believes it was some deep down vision about both the fall idea, just expressed differently, and also the, the time that extraterrestrial beings landed on earth and became humans. So that's what the vision means to him. That's what his belief is. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like some people like him have organically developed to that idea anyway. Like, man, deep down, things used to be perfect. Like, like not used yeah. to be like last week, but like used to be like way, 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 way back. Things were perfect. And we chose this, you know? Yeah. We chose to enter this world of suffering and distance from God. And now we're kind of struggling our way back, you know? Yeah, yeah. The fact that that sort of reoccurs is kind of a union archetypal right. thing. Right, yeah. Like that said that's a story that makes sense to people. And so it recurs in, in people's psyches 
despite right. the fact that like they're not telling it exactly the same way, but they're telling the same themes. Yeah. yeah. And I do like the idea intuitively or philosophically that if we can even conceptualize a perfect state of consciousness that we crave or that we strive for, maybe we experienced it before deep down. Mm -hmm. I like I like the idea intuitively, not just as a Christian idea, but and and also I'm, there's plenty of Christians that would articulate the idea in a way that I would think was silly, mm -hmm. and so it it just doesn't seem like a strictly Christian idea to me. But yeah, and you know Eugene's, I thought it was interesting that like Eugene's vision that you're talking about, mm -hmm. it like we've discussed that like it it's a lot like the story of like the Garden of Eden mm -hmm. and that fall. But it's also very similar to the story of, like, Lucifer leading a third of the angels yeah. away from God. Yeah. I never thought about that before. That like, those stories are, are very similar things. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it has common themes from both of them. Uh, he pointed that out about the Adam and Eve uh, synchronicity when he first told me the story. Uh, I was at the park. I saw him, and I felt like God wanted me to go talk to him. Mm -hmm. So I walked over, introduced myself, and I just started bullshitting with him. He was cooking food on a little grill. I was just asking about food. and then, But I, I planned on getting to know him enough to hear his perspective on God and then see if there was something maybe I could do to help him. This other guy came up and was just like, Hey, man, I'm a Christian. I'm just here to like tell you guys about Jesus. you know. And I was just like, Oh, fucking Christ. So he starts like, just telling this guy, like, hey, have you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you know? Right. And I, and I was like, bro, maybe ask him his fucking name or something. Like, <laughs> you just, <laughs> like, you think God gives you credit for just walking up and copy-pasting a blurb onto a stranger and think that you did something? Like, he doesn't, right. you don't know this man. Right. You don't know. And, and so, even if you did, like, even if you did talk him into being like, Oh, my life will be better if I if I pray for Jesus to be my savior and, right. and forgive all my sin. Like even if he did talk him into that, he's not really going to end up with uh, a very like committed or serious convert. Right. So it's like no. it's the the goal of that is not to make like a someone with a serious connection to Christ. It's yeah. the goal is to it's a numbers game. It's a point. It's a numbers game because he wants to go back to his church and say, "I got three points this weekend," mm -hmm. and then. It's wow, going really to give him me. advantage wow. on the dating hierarchy of his church. He <laughs> might get to hook up with Jessica instead of Brittany because he got four points over there. <laughs> so ridiculous. Yeah. But uh, there's kind of a little brother, big brother thing with me and Homie because um, Homie as in the Christian that annoyed me mm -hmm. because uh, let me go back to the vision thing real quick. So mm -hmm. Eugene tells us both his vision and this Christian guy is like, is like well, that's not like in the Bible, you know? And the guy said, like, like he was saying, I don't believe in Christianity. I do have faith. I'll tell you what my faith is. It's based on something that I've seen. Here's what I saw. I think it's similar to the Adam and Eve story. He even said that as he presented the vision to us. Yeah. And I was like, this man just told you that he organically had a vision that corroborates our belief that we have rooted in the Adam and Eve story. And instead of celebrating that, and finding common ground, you're telling him it's not in the Bible? Right. The only interesting things that have ever happened are in this book. Yeah, nothing They're else. In the one. <laughs> only book you need. Yeah, don't go to the doctor or anything. This is the only book you need. <laughs> nothing else that's not in this book happened. Oh. So, well, anyway. Some things, only boring things. <laughs> only things that aren't exciting. Only things that don't pertain to belief. And honey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but this guy, um, part of the, like, the little brother, big brother thing, we got into a debate. I we all sat there and talked for like two hours. And um, a lot of it was me and Eugene being irritated with this guy. And he took it like a champ, dude. He sat there through two hours mm -hmm. and let us criticize him. And at one point, I interrupted him and was like, like, let me tell you, man, I don't think that you're here to connect somebody's heart with Jesus. I think you're here for your own pride and you just want to preach to somebody. And he's like, I am here to preach. And it's like, all right, well, let's talk about that. Is that what, blah, blah, blah. I'm attacking this guy and not holding back. And uh, I can be pretty aggressive, and this guy was just taking it and just like, okay, okay, listening, responding. And then I can't remember the details of it, but there was something later in the conversation that I said something that I later realized wasn't theologically correct, and the guy might have been correct in one of the arguments that we had mm -hmm. uh, as I reflected later. And then the next time I hung out with Eugene, he told me that after I walked away, because I walked away before the other Christian did, um, that dude pulled like 80 or 100 bucks or something out of his wallet and gave it to Eugene at the end wow. of the conversation. 
So it's like his heart, he, I don't know if he was doing what he was doing for the reasons he thought he was, but I know that he thought he was, if that makes sense. Wait, what? what I don't know if, what, I don't what know if he was, I don't know if he was really talking to Eugene to teach Eugene about Jesus and what Jesus means to him, or if he was just there to score points, but I know mm -hmm. that, that he thought he was there to talk to Eugene about Jesus. He was there to show godly love yeah, to sure. Eugene. He was. Sure. I think he, there are people playing the points game that don't really think about it in that way. They think, yeah. like, this is the game that God wants me to play. They yeah. don't think about it as, like... Yeah, they don't realize that yeah. that's the wrong way to go about it. And yeah. then and a lot of people, if challenged in that situation, would have just walked away. Like, they're not mm -hmm. going to let this, like, smart mouth kid and this homeless guy roast you for talking about Jesus. going to be like well, then you two don't want to hear the message and you're a false teacher warned about you and the blah, blah, blah. And, they and, just and I'll pray away. for you. Yeah, and I'll pray for you. Um, make sure you guys are very lost and, and right. I, I hope that Jesus leads you back to the flock. Right, yeah. a lot of people, he could have done that and he didn't. He sat there and listened yeah. and learned That's and then put a hundred bucks out of his pocket at the end yeah. and he did it after I left. He didn't do that shit in front of me. So and Eugene dude, turned out you, to be cool. Yeah, Eugene, Eugene told, told, me told me later. Wow. Yeah. Nice. So, um... That's one example of me being a Pharisee of Pharisees. Like, instead of walking into that situation and seeing, seeing it as my job, like, if I want to be the salt of the earth, like, absorb negativity and just and be a light and put out good things, I would look at that situation and be like, how can I love you and how can I love you? It's easy for me to love Eugene. It's not easy for me to love, and I don't remember his name. Homie. Yeah, homie. Yeah, yeah. that's what it was. Right. Um, with a Y. Oh, cool. It it was it wasn't easy for me to love homie, and he deserved it just as much as Eugene. He had yeah. a completely different, and something that I did annoyed both of them. And so it's like, are we all going to have grace for each other? Or are we going to reserve grace for for the, the people that we like? You know, no, yeah. I like this type of person. I don't like the Pharisees. Like, yeah, I I think at some level that's like it it feels, it's like more attractive to try and help someone that knows they're broken than somebody that is certain they're not. Right. And the truth is that almost everyone he is. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So that's at least like, we're starting from a place of like, at least you know that you need help. Right. Yeah. And this guy, he didn't know that, that I could be helpful to him in any way. He actually, no, he reacted to the other guy more like that. He's like, you, you have nothing to offer me, you know? But we actually both learned a lot from that guy. Mm -hmm. Like, like seeing the, because me as a person who's, who's critical towards the, the Pharisee type of spiritual condition, I learned that a person with that type of spiritual condition can also be super humble and committed and generous. And this guy who, he had a family, he had kids, he was spending his time out in the park for two hours getting criticized by two strangers that he didn't know anything. So yeah. it's like, man, that's actually a cool I'm impressed when motherfucker. someone goes to a park. He goes to the park. Yeah. yeah. They left yeah. their house, went to a park. Yeah. It's <laughs> amazing. Wow, dude. What is it, 1955? You know, there's YouTube videos of parks. <laughs> you could easily watch a kid build a park on Minecraft at home. It's way cooler. <laughs> there's no rules there. Yeah. Um, let's see. I think there's only one other point from the book I was uh, that really, like, jumped off the pages at me. Timothy Keller quotes somebody. I think it was C.S. Lewis again. Um but the last C.S. Lewis I quote I brought up, I don't think it was from this book. I think that was something I heard here in a sermon or something. Mm. But uh, he brings up this C.S. Lewis story about how C.S. Lewis had a friend die. And C.S. Lewis wrote a letter afterwards, as he does, about his friend that died. And said one of the things that he was mourning was the fact that the types of jokes that that friend who had passed away made got a specific type of reaction out of one of their mutual friends that C.S. Lewis would never be able to see again. So, like, if, if you died and it's like, well, like, not only am I mourning my brother, but I'm also mourning the fact that there's no dynamic like hanging out with me, Raleigh, and Juice. Or there's no mm -hmm. dynamic like yeah. me, Raleigh, and Sarah. Or there's, so people bring out different sides of each other. And right. the, the reason that Keller brought up the story was to, was to make an argument for attending church because he's kind of, uh, he's, he was kind of radical in this book about the fact that, that what Jesus has to offer is available to everybody. So at the end of the book, he wanted to make the argument that he still thinks it's valuable to go to church and be in a Christian community or a mm -hmm. Jesus-centered gathering, as Jesus would say. And uh, 
And so he was saying that one of the values, one of the valuable things about being in a Christian community is that each person might be able to bring a different aspect of Jesus out of you by the way that they interact with you. Mm -hmm. And that you need community for an individual to be fully seen. For an individual to be fully seen, or at least more seen, you need more people around you. Like if you only know one person, there's, there's plenty, like there's plenty of things that you and I don't talk about when we talk. There's things that when you and Sarah talk, there's other things you don't talk about. Like yeah. you bring a different side of yourself to everybody around you. Totally. And so the value of having a community where everybody brings something different out of each other and people get to be seen in a different and unique way by all these different type of people and they're all united around this radical grace, radical love idea. It's like, yeah. that's quite an opportunity to be in a community like that. If it, and there's plenty of Christian communities that are on different levels of actually achieving that sort of radical grace, radical love, let's all see each other and value each other atmosphere. Yeah. But man, if we, if we could really get that, that's fucking cool. Yeah. So I thought that was a really cool point by C.S. Lewis. Yeah, that's a really interesting idea that like a, a part of you like an aspect of yourself dies when when someone you used to talk to dies mm -hmm. because that won't be brought out anymore. Yeah. That like against a different background, you're kind of a different thing. Mm -hmm. In a different context, you're not the same thing that you are. Yeah. And yeah. I'm so a I'm piece certainly... of you dies in that sense when, when somebody dies. The, the piece of you that they brought out of you, that they inspired out of you, that piece of you dies. Like they're not there to bring that out of you anymore. Yeah, yeah. And that's why it's that's why it's so hard when like when like an era of your life ends. Right. And like you know that this same group of people won't be together mm -hmm. in the same context ever again. Yeah, it's a death. It is a death. It's yeah. a death of, of some sort of moment that existed. Mm-hmm. And so yeah, that sort of that sort of death is constantly happening. The scenario mm -hmm. is constantly changing. And as much as as much as we'd all like to like hold on to uh, a moment and like mm -hmm. make this thing never end, it's right. not it's not how it works. Yeah, everything has to keep changing. Yeah, everything is always changing. It's always yeah. even if you just even your relationship with somebody changes. Like our relationship before and during the podcast. Now we have a different relationship than we did before we did a podcast together. Yeah. Now when we meet up, we talk about this, whatever shit we were talking about instead before this. Yeah. Like that's dead. That died. Like, pretty wild to think about. It is. Yeah. It's, it's a really interesting idea. Yeah. Well, Prodigal God, Timothy Keller, shorter episode, makes sense. It was The book is only 120, 130 something pages. Um, first time around reading it, though, I really found myself stopping every few pages because Timothy Keller is a, a pretty powerful philosopher, in my opinion. He's got wisdom bombs that he drops. So it's a book of wisdom and insight more than it is a book of information and knowledge. So it's a book that you could you can cruise through because the first time I read it, I was pausing every few pages and just like reflecting on shit and be like, damn. And the second time I read it, I just busted through it in a day. And it's, it's a cool book because I feel like you can read it either way. Mm -hmm. You can just you can blaze through it and see the big picture of what he's describing or you can just read little sections of it. Um, as long as you're trying to earn your salvation by controlling God through goodness, you will never be sure you have been good enough for him. You simply aren't sure that God loves and delights in you. Controlling God through goodness? Yeah. I, I don't understand. The older brother was telling his father that he owed him a certain loyalty over the younger brother in exchange for all of the goodness and consistency that he had given the father. So older okay. brother was saying like, so he's he trying was to control reminding his him. father with, hit the responsibility that he has taken right exactly yeah. he's saying he's saying i've been serving you but you you owe me and yeah. so if, if you're the type of religious person that's like well i've had all of this great moralistic record for this long and now my house burns down like fuck you god you're gonna burn my house down i've been going to church for 10 years that is the type of attitude that that can separate you from god and separate you from the big picture it's like well were you doing the good god good deeds because you thought God would reward you for him? Because if so, you're just going to a store. You're right. Just, and you don't get points for going to the store. Right. You, you don't get points for working and then spending your money, and you don't get points for doing good deeds and then expecting something in return. That sort of mentality separates you from experiencing God's grace 
the sort of experience of cosmic grace that can transform you genuinely yeah. can't get there if you think it's an exchange. Yeah, yeah. It it always that kind of reminds me of like how it feels gross when somebody uh, is doing something generous or like doing something charitable, mm -hmm. but then it doesn't feel like it's actually. It's yeah. not about just being charitable. Right. It's about like the clout that right. they get for yeah. doing it. Dude, me in a nutshell a few years back. And that was one of the, when I went nuts and posted all this stuff on Facebook mm -hmm. and like went through a quarter life crisis, that was one of the things I said in uh, my first post was I, I brag about how much money I raise for charity and I don't volunteer at those charities. Mm -hmm. That's like, you can, the proof is in the pudding right there. It's like, well, do you care about the charity? Because if so, you would give them your, your time too. You know, you'd be mm -hmm. passionate about that. And yeah. it's like, like the charity I was giving money to is a teen shelter. And I knew how to do that sort of work. I knew how to mentor teens. I knew how to talk to somebody who was going through some shit and staying at the shelter for the night, but I've never asked to volunteer there. But I was happy bragging about all the money that I raised. So it's like, and Jesus says, you don't get credit for that. If you do something good and then you brag about it, you got your reward. If you do something good and you don't do anything to get credit for it, then God will reward you later. Yeah. But not if you do it because you think God will reward you later. It's just tricky, right? Yeah. But the yeah. only way to really get yourself to a place where you practice radical grace is to get yourself to the place that you experienced radical grace, knowing that you didn't deserve it, like messing up so much and then just crying out to the universe and being like, I need a second chance, bro. I need to start over. I need to totally revamp my character. This isn't working and actually get that chance yeah. and have that transform you to the point that you're motivated and inspired to show grace from a pure heart because you've received it. That's real religious transformation. But like, yeah, I raise a lot of money for charity. I go to church every weekend. It's just like, that ain't it, dude. God doesn't yeah. care. People don't care, frankly. You know, at yeah. least anybody real is going to see through that shit. So yeah. You know, this. I used to say, when I was younger, I used to always say that my favorite Bible verse was, like, Dad used to say this one a lot, mm -hmm. was the notion, it was something like, uh, someone who does something nice, or someone who does something and and brags about it, mm -hmm. already got the reward. Yeah. And so you don't get the reward in heaven. Right. And I was just thinking that that's kind of funny that that used to be like my favorite verse because I wasn't all that, I wasn't all that like committed, of of like a Christian when I was younger. And mm -hmm. well, and this was even after I even considered myself Christian. I kind mm -hmm. of felt that way, but that's sort of like a a second layer Pharisee kind of thing because mm -hmm. like I'm judging the people that. I'm like acting better oh, than yeah, the people yeah, yeah. that are that think that they're being that are being better than. Yeah. 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 I'm better than people who are better than people. Who yeah. Are better than people who are better than. <laughs> yeah. And so now I'm a layer deeper. Mm -hmm. It feels pretty good. Right. Yeah. yeah. We're better than a lot of people right now. For sure. Like we've been very honest, very self-reflective, very vulnerable. I'm feeling like we have perfect character right now. Yeah. Not like past Raleigh. <laughs> yeah. Just joke. And we've been talking about karma on some of the podcasts and mm -hmm. uh it's it makes sense like with the with the karmic idea you get you get bad karma for bragging and you get good karma for doing good things so it's like well if you want to do a good thing and brag about it and just have it be a wash be my guest you know like i yeah. feel like god is saying like go ahead you know you're not going to get a fucking standing ovation from me but you can if you want you want to brag about doing something nice yeah neutral <laughs> no good karma, no bad totally. karma. You're good. Yeah. I guess, if you want to just do that. Yeah. But it's a dead end. It doesn't feel good. There's no progression in it. It's just do something good, brag about it, feel bad about myself, do another good thing. Like, it's just, that ain't it. Yeah. 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 When when I, when John Chang talked about, like, the, the, the black wave and the white wave, mm -hmm. he, when he was talking about karma and, like, what happens when you die, whether you go, which place you go to, that, like, mm -hmm. it's based on your judgment as to whether you deserve to go to a place where, like, you owe something mm -hmm. or whether you deserve to go to a place where you are owed something. Mm -hmm. And it's based on, like, your... And not you as, like, as you are right this moment because you aren't... Your current incarnation or whatever isn't totally wise. It isn't, like, totally yeah, self-aware. Yeah, yeah. mm -hmm. But in your most self-aware state, you know whether you are owed something or whether you owe something. So it makes sense that, like, you know, 
bragging about something that you know mm -hmm. that you actually did get rewarded for that already. Mm -hmm. You already know that that you were able to hook up with Jessica instead of whoever yeah, at the church of because, because you bragged that yeah. that you got this point. Yeah. And you know that. Yeah, and you know damn well. Yeah. You know damn well. Me and uh, Eugene have been doing, uh, the last time that we met up and talked, we were doing work around um, karma and past lives because he, he experienced such horrific abuse as a child. It's just, it's hard to even wrap your mind around it. And, um, and witnessed, witnessed and experienced sexual abuse and torture and dark religious rituals and just all sorts of just deep, just dark mess, stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. it's ridiculous stuff. And so the last time I talked to him, no, sorry, the time before the last time, uh, he, he was still talking about the same things he was trying to process the year before. You know, he's still stuck in the same loop and black wave internally that he was the year before. And so he's telling me the same shit he told me the year before. And it's like, I was like, do you remember any past lives? Like, do, have you had any past life memory experiences or anything like that? Do you, have you ever delved into trying to understand how these things could be happening to you, like try to find some cosmic understanding or justification or, mm -hmm. or reasoning for it, you know? And uh, he said that he had. So we met up and started talking about that. And he had remembered all of these past lives where he was like, he was like raping and pillaging villages and shit. Like he was just doing all these crazy unspeakable things mm -hmm. in numerous eras of history. And uh, he does feel like he was put in a position to, to do some time for that in this lifetime and then he also feels that he was put here that his number one mission is to 100 percent unconditionally love his parents who put him through everything he feels like if he can do that he accomplished what he needed to accomplish in this lifetime mm. so if are his parents still alive yeah both wow no sorry just his mom okay it's just his mom is dead his dad is still alive not that that's super not that it's super important whether right. they are or aren't yeah yeah. But, uh, right. Uh, yeah. Psychologically speaking, you can still experience that, that, uh, that grace for them. You can still yeah. go through being reunited with your parents, psychologically speaking. Yeah. Someone doesn't have to be there to accept it for you to forgive them. Right. Right. Yeah. Even if, so if a, if a Christian who doesn't believe in past lives is listening to this or a secular person or whatever, maybe Eugene is just inventing a psychological, manufacture justification for the things that he experienced and then manufacturing some hero complex of what he has to do that's really noble in this lifetime to blah 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 but it's like mm -hmm. all right you try to talk to somebody in that position you try to talk to somebody who was tortured so relentlessly as a child that they're now in their 60s and it's all they think about every day and yeah. you try and find a way to get them to to come to some peace it's like there's no that's how you do it you've yeah. got to understand how there's some cosmic explanation for what happened to you it's like what are you going to say to him you know what happened to you was completely unfair like yeah i know that's why i've been bashing myself in the head over this for decades is that what yeah. happened to me was so unfair and so inexplicable yeah. but to think that all of that junk that we've done in the past generations and generations of violence and trauma that we've experienced as a human race, if you think all of that in the collective consciousness just evaporates and we don't answer for it now, I think that's crazy, mm. you know? That, to look at all of the wars and violence and, and, and horror that we've experienced over the generations and not think that that's going to affect us today in some way, I think is silly. Yeah. It's maybe gonna echo. Yeah, and, and maybe it's just a biological, maybe it's just an inherited... Uh, echo and it's not really the past life thing but but I believe in the past life thing and and we were talking about the fact that the grace that Jesus offers to people like hey I'm willing to forgive you for everything bad that you've done if you can if you can come on this journey with me and forgive as you're forgiven like the Lord's prayer says forgive me as I forgive others or one translation I really liked was uh, untangle me as I untangle others so that everyone can be untangled. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can do that, does that extend between, does that extend to your past lives too? You know, and, and so that's what we were talking about and praying about together. It was like everything that Eugene's done in past lives, can he have peace about everything that has happened to Eugene in this lifetime and others too? Can he have peace about, can he have peace about everything and can you just get a fresh start? 
from here all the way back. Because I don't think there's many people talking about the forgiveness Jesus offers and talking about past lives. I think a lot of people digest the grace that Jesus offers on a pretty shallow level. Mm-hmm. And, and the, in terms of like how deeply into your consciousness you really embed that idea that yeah. you're forgiven, you have a fresh start. No, like completely. Not like you're forgiven for the fact that you stole somebody's clothes out of the laundry machine last week. Like you're forgiven for all of the even subconscious trauma that you feel. Like you feel anxious because your ancestors were hiding from Nazis, you know? Like you can leave all of that behind. You can, or, or you feel anxious because your ancestors were hunting Jews. Mm-hmm. You can leave all of that old shit behind, everything. You can get a complete 100% fresh start. So that's the, the last session that we did was about that. And then uh, he was texting me like some really cool prayer experiences that, uh, that he's been having since then. And it seems like he's getting to a better place. Like just, just having somebody to just bullshit with about Jesus and what it means rather than like make it all religious or whatever. So that's been pretty cool. But um, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really We're, cool we've book. been off prodigal God for 10 minutes, so I think it's time to call it. It was you adjacent. Everything's adjacent. Everything's, Everything's everything adjacent. has to do with everything. It's everything, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. That sounds cool. I, it sounds like a lot of good ideas, and, and yeah, I liked hearing about it. It's awesome. Night school. Night school. You got to say good game. That's your like, good your, game. Like, good game, right good now. game. Good game.